G'day investors, crypto goers, traditionalists and futurists. I'm Adam Stokes. Welcome back to the channel. We are honored to have Martin North with us again. Martin, thanks for coming back. Hi Adam, good to speak to you once again. Martin, I see you're preparing for the bushfires over there. How's it all going? Yeah, well, it's, you know, interesting. Um, we are in a sort of a bush fire prone area. So I spent some time today sweeping up and tidying up and, you know, making sure that everything was set ready. Um, we hope we won't need it, but tomorrow is looking a pretty um, a bad day. So my thoughts are with all those all around the country who have already been displaced, who've lost property or even worse, you know, lost, lost lives. But um, I think this is going to get very serious. Uh, and of course, the economic consequences, which is one thing I want to talk about, not now, but down the track, I think are going to be profound. Um, this is a big deal. Yeah, I'm quite nervous here in the nation's capital. The amount of smoke was beyond comprehension. So I survived the 2003 bushfires, which was very intense in Canberra. It went very mm. black very quickly. Massive firestorm, the speed, the wind was beyond comprehension. But what I don't remember from that time was the amount of smoke. Now, today, we've actually got it quite clear here. And I'm, worried, I'm kind of worried quietly that it's the calm before the storm. That is, it's getting a little bit, I don't know, eerily clear and quiet before we have what could be coming over the next few days, particularly with that heat wave. But I, I wish you all the best. And I um, appreciate you putting out that video today because it certainly um, stimulated my thoughts not so much cleaning up around the place which i've been very disciplined with but i need to get water pressure to get water out of my water tanks and out of my pool to somewhere because certainly when the fire comes power is one of the first things that disappears yep absolutely well it's interesting i heard a lot of feedback from that to you know i put out which essentially was of me on my roof <laughs> talking about the things i was doing right and people said look i really appreciate that really honest and straightforward view of what's going on because of course overseas most people have just seen these um, TV pictures of huge blazes and thousands of people right and, and they said well it's interesting to get a slightly different perspective so that's quite quite fascinating yeah Martin let's get into money what we love discussing I want to um, <laughs> open up with a quote I want to get to the philosophy of money with you and mm. perhaps look at the two sides of uh, what I like to call traditionalist uh, versus, in some respects, futurist. That is, those who are, are very supportive of the old banking systems and the potential to bring fiat into what it once was and the new evolution of money, which is cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and the two opposing sides to this. So I'll open up with this quote and I'll get your thoughts on it. Up until 2008, sovereignty created money. Now money creates sovereignty. The world's biggest population is not China, it's on the internet. The world's biggest economy is not centralized in the USA, it's decentralizing on the internet. Your thoughts on that, my friend? Well, I think we've got to stand back just a little bit because there's a difference, I think, between money um, as, if you like, its, its formal definition and what the characteristics of money are, and we should, we should touch on that, and then how money is actually executed and implemented because what you're forgetting is that the way that the financial systems around the world have run is that they are actually geographically defined up till this point. And what that quote is saying is, is are we now moving beyond geography? Right? That's the fundamental um, point. Because if you actually believe that eventually we're going to get to the point where effectively there is going to be a cross-geographic basis for all of the characteristics of money, which is a unit of account, a store of value, and a medium exchange, that's the classic um, three-way definition, then there's a chance. But I think there's a long way to go before we're there, because if you think about the way that money works at the moment, actually the value un is actually anchored back within individual countries who actually control the flow of money and the definition of money and all of those things. So in this new super geographic digital world with that dissipating what have you actually got and i think that's probably an interesting place to sort of start the conversation perhaps okay so on that we say um, money is anchored back to as you were saying to uh, nations but if we look at dollars or sorry currencies that are pegged to the us dollar that that kind of throws it out of whack uh well no, so, so you've got to think about this firstly as the, the currency within a geographic domain, right? So if you think about it, the Fed basically issues um, a currency, uh, 
in the US, it's US dollars. Then we've got all the international trading of the US dollar, and as you say, other people are actually then locking their currencies to the US dollar because the US dollar is seen as a reserve currency, right? I mean, that's the way it's worked. Traditionally, of course, it wasn't the US dollar, it was gold, because if you go back in history, gold tended to be that anchor point. And so effectively, we had currencies an anchored to gold until the point where I think the Vietnam War was the last one. It basically blew up because they needed to create more money. Right? And, and, and that's a really important point, because if you think about it, what happens now is that the Federal Reserve in the US or the Reserve Bank in Australia can basically just increase the money supply and therefore put more you know, dollars into the market. But you're not actually increasing the value of anything. What you're doing is decreasing the value. So you, know, you hold up a, a $10 note. What's behind that $10 note? Why is that $10 note going to pay $10 rather than $5 or $20? Well, it's basically because of the way that, um, you know, it works at the moment simply because that's the value set. But if money keeps being printed, then the value of that $10 note in a few years' time will be worth $5 in today's terms, right? So you're basically eroding value all the time, right? So that's the first one. And then going back to this, this linking it to the dollar, right? There are many people around the world who are now getting to the point of saying, well, how long will the US be that reserve currency? You know, what will be the alternatives to that and some people are saying well is it the um, you know Chinese yuan or is it um, some sort of um, you know co uh, cryptocurrency with some asset back behind it you know that's what um, Mark Carney from the um, Bank of England said the other week uh, or, or something else um, very interesting debate very interesting question but it goes back to control right because essentially everybody has controls around their particular element within, within, within the finance. Now, if you go to Bitcoin, as an example of a cryptocurrency, right? yep, it's completely digitized, it's completely um, decentralized, there is no centralized control. But the question is, to what extent does Bitcoin pass the test as a definition of money? Right? And I think we might want to debate that for a bit. Right, so I, I would actually say that what money is, is a language. So if we if we look at the history of language, the, the scripture, shall we say, so the first recorded uh, sign or the first recorded artifact of, of written language was in fact a, a ledger, a spreadsheet, a spreadsheet of debts of farmer A owed something to farmer B or vice versa. So when we actually look at language in the first instance, it's uh, in written language, in written scripture, it was about money. Now, we've seen this money evolve, whether it be a knot on a piece of string or feathers, beads, gold, etc. As we've moved through, uh, through the timeline and as we're talking about philosophy, the perspective of how we look at things, first of all, through our own paradigms, through what we carry and our own life experiences, but secondly, through the time period of that time. Now, we've seen many things evolve over time, but one of the things that has really failed to innovate, in my opinion, is the banking sector. And in my opinion, the reason why the banking sector has not innovated sufficiently or uh, caught up with the rest of the world as, as we've had exponential innovation is because it's actually in their best interest to not innovate. That is, it is in their best interest to not move away from a system where they can print their own money, taking the Federal Reserve as an example. Now, noting the Federal Reserve is neither a federal entity nor has any reserves of any value per se. <laughs> if we look at what money is, money is, and I think you touched on this before, you were saying in, in broad terms, money is a language where you and I agree that if I give you this, whatever it is today, tomorrow it will be worth something. Now, when we translate that to our paradigm of our, our first world privilege, and we say, well, why do we need this Bitcoin thing? Our money is pretty stable. We know that there's about 2% inflation, which in, in a scary terms, in 36 years, your money is worth half of what it was today. And that's only if it's at 2%. If we've got, as we've seen, inflation goes up a little higher, that money is cutting in half, not every 36 years, it could be every 20 years. Now, if we move our paradigm away from the first world, noting that there's at least 2.5 billion people unbanked on the planet. And we go to someone like, and that's completely unbanked, there's more people that don't really have access to computing and banking systems, but purely unbanked, 2.5 billion. A $20 mobile phone could could change that. And a, 
example of the first digital currency was basically seen in Africa when someone went to buy bread at the shop. Uh, I, I can't remember if it was actually bread, but they went to buy something and they didn't have any money. But someone said, hey, I'll trade you mobile minutes, as in how many minutes you can talk on your mobile phone for this commodity, for this stock, for this food, for whatever it is. And that was basically the first evolution of real digital money where they said, hey, I'll give you this digital asset, talk time minutes on a mobile phone. They exchanged it and a good an exchange took place. In the first world, as I mentioned, we don't really need it per se because we've kind of accepting that 2% is what is what inflation is and what, what we're comfortable with. But what happens when we start to move into hyperinflation, as we can see, as we've discussed previously on the channel with uh, not, not so much as hyperinflation itself, but the system breaking where we have bail-in laws and uh, negative interest rates and then inflation on top of that. What if people want to move out of these systems? Why can't they have the freedom to choose what money is? <laughs> well, it goes back to what I said, right? That that two point whatever it was um, billion people, right? A lot of them will be in India. A lot of them will be in other specific countries, all of which has a currency within which they currently operate. So essentially what you're arguing for is a replacement of the current currency for a digital alternative in that particular country, right? And then you immediately come up against the power base of who's going to control that. Remember that at the moment the Federal Reserve in the US and uh, the central banks around the world want to control flows of money. They are concerned about things like money laundering. They're concerned about things like inflation targeting, all of those things. And they will say we, we would lose control if in fact we um, gave that up. So that's the first point. Second point is, um, going back to my definition of money, a unit of accounting, a store of value, and a medium of exchange. The question is, how do you actually work out what the value of a, for example, Bitcoin is when there's such volatility in the exchange rate of Bitcoin? Um, now, you can translate that two ways. You could say, well, it doesn't matter because if I'm buying and selling in Bitcoin and I reside in Bitcoin all the time, then that's cool because it doesn't matter. But at the moment, everybody keeps converting back and forth between Bitcoin and the US dollar or Bitcoin and Aussie dollar, right? And so that volatile movement means that you have no idea what the value of Bitcoin is from day one to day two, which means that it doesn't pass the test at the moment as uh, a store of value. Um, it may go up, it may go down, it's a speculative instrument, right? That's my view. And then the other point to make is that as a unit of accounting, it's very interesting to consider that this could be a global unit of, account unit of accounting beyond currency def definitions, border definitions. That's a whole new thing, right? And I suspect that governments and central banks around the world will push back very firmly on that. I don't think that's going to fly. We are going to end up more likely with central bank digital currencies, which will effectively be electronic versions of the currencies we've currently got. And let me make the final point here is that today, even with what we have at the moment, most payments are electronic. Most are digital. It's just it's digital within the definitions of existing currencies like Aussie dollars or US dollars, not the other. So it's not like we're moving from non-digital to digital. Digital is already there now. What we're talking about is who's controlling. Is it centralized and decentralized? And what is the anchor pin of value? Right. And at the moment, I don't think either of those two questions can be answered in the affirmative for any of the cryptocurrencies that exist. So the, I, I agree that we're already in a digital age. So I agree that we're already using digital money. The key difference between uh, the digital fiat and digital cryptocurrency is primarily, the uh, two primarily factor, primary factors are the uh, decentralization and the, and the limited supply. So we spoke about... Uh, centralized bodies having control over how much money there is. Now, there's different levers, levers within an economy, the money supply, the interest rate, the tax rate, buying and selling bonds and so forth. And these are all ways of controlling an economy. And the money supply, the biggest lever is simply pressing print. Now, in the past, they actually pressed print. But now, of course, because it's digital, there's, there's actually physically nothing to, to print. It's just uh, putting numbers on a screen. It's just, it's just now, entry, yeah. 
Yep, yep. agreed. So yep. it's, it's as simple as me as opening an Excel spreadsheet on my computer right now and saying I have a billion. Now, of course, where that's unfair in the free market is only some people can do that and not everyone can do that. And the other thing that's unfair about that is every time that they do that, it dilutes everyone's money. It dilutes everyone's money through creating a excessive supply or a growing supply, uh, which of course is uh, creates an inflationary asset or income as opposed to a deflationary one, which I'd argue is Bitcoin. So I'm, I'm going to make a, a distinction here between cryptocurrencies per se, noting there's over 2000 cryptocurrencies in the world and, and Bitcoin itself. So Bitcoin is uh, has a fixed supply of 21 million, which is divisible by 100 million parts called a Satoshi. And each one of those parts is divisible again by another thousand parts, which is called a micro Satoshi. And arguably because it's digital, those 21 million parts can be divided arguably infinitely, but they are still a set supply of 21 million whole Bitcoins. When we go over to fiat currencies and we're talking about the volatility, I agree. At the moment, you have a tiny market, and I gave the analogy before, you have this ocean of these huge amounts of money compared to a big market such as a shipping container, a cargo ship, the wave hits that cargo ship, and it moves a little bit. Then when you have a tiny little market like Bitcoin, and the same wave hits that uh, fishing boat, if you will, it goes all the way up and all the way down. Now, when we talk about the volatility of a fiat currency for someone like a Venezuelan, in, in my opinion, I think they would much prefer the volatility, if you will, of Bitcoin going up 9 million percent aggregate over 10 years, this type of volatility, as opposed to their, I believe it's called the Bolivar, going down like this over time. So an example of a Venezuelan escaping hyperinflation was buying white goods, as, as in actually buying a washing machine or a fridge, wrapping it up in glad wrap to avoid the volatility of the markets, that being a washing machine being $1,000 this week and literally $1 million next week. And they were looking for ways to escape from that volatility. So again, with our paradigm, we would say, well, why do we need to worry about moving over to a digital currency when we've got already a digital currency and it's kind of stable with the 2%? What I would argue is that, first of all, it's 2% now. We don't know if it'll be 2% in many years' time. We can see that there is inflation coming in and we can see, as I mentioned before, other laws coming in that are forcing us to put our money in non-elected centralised businesses, banks, and dealing with non-democratic systems such as bail-in laws, which are just absurd, where they're literally allowed to steal your money. If we look at something like, I would say, a skeuomorphic design. So let's look at let's look at uh, the car, for example. So it wasn't until 30 years after the car, the first car was released, that we made a steering wheel. For the first 30 years, they used reins like a horse. Now, the skeuomorphic designs applied to money. I would argue is that the skeuomorphic design is saying, hey, we have to centralise our money in this centralised system, a bank or a Federal Reserve, and we have to give these people the power. Bitcoin argues, why do we have to give them the power? And not only why do we have to give them the power, but when it comes to those three facets of what makes money, store of value, uh, what were the other two? Store of value, medium exchange and the accounting. I, I don't see how Bitcoin doesn't tick all three of those boxes. Yes, I'll accept the volatility for now, but comparative to the Bolivar, it's volatility of 9 million percent, the best return on any commodity we've ever seen, over, well, we've seen over the last 10 years. Bitcoin meets those three things. So how would... How would <laughs> well, you, but you, you and I disagree on that, right? Because uh, okay, I, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't believe that it passes the, the standard tests yet. It may in the future... Right, but I don't necessarily agree with you because I don't think you can use it as a unit of account because you've no idea what it is, what it's worth, and um, you know you you can count things in bits of Bitcoin. You also have Bitcoin forks, which doesn't help, and there's a lot of confusion as to how all that all that actually plays in. Right, so I, I'm I'm worried about that. In terms of a store of value, um, well it's speculatively gone up dramatically there's no guarantee that it will go, continue to go up it might go down it's already gone down twice from you know a very high point to a low point come up and it's gone down again so 
interesting question is it likely to go up go down i know there are lots of uh, crypto bulls who say oh, it's going to go up well, of course it's going to go up we've got a limited supply you know unlimited demand it's bound to go up well yeah maybe um others would perhaps prove to disagree so it doesn't really pass the um the test on um to my mind at least so um in terms of the accounting no in terms of the store of value no as a medium of exchange well sure you can certainly translate it from one bitcoin or bits of bitcoin to you know another currency and back or you can buy things by the way it's very hard to buy a lot of things i mean whether you've tried to actually buy real things with bitcoins there are a few um companies around the world in Australia who will actually take bitcoins but the majority of um, uh, of organizations in who are selling things don't take it so at the moment it's got very limited capacity to actually be um, used in, as a medium of exchange so I, I would argue that on the key tests which are the you know the universal tests of what a currency is it doesn't yet pass muster I'm, I'm really enjoying this because I can <laughs> I feel I can counter all of those. So I'm trying to write <laughs> Good. Here. Yeah, I'm enjoying this. Okay, so first of all, I want to clean up the Bitcoin forking thing. So yep. when when Bitcoin forks, so not to get too technical, but it's operating on the SHA-256 algorithm, which some argue is quite a primitive algorithm, and the block sizes have been somewhat small. Now, when they fork, I'll give uh, Bitcoin Cash as an example and Bitcoin SV. In, in all honesty and in all facts, those forks don't actually create a new Bitcoin. It just creates a different coin. So I mentioned at the beginning of this, there are over 2,000 cryptocurrencies in the world. Yeah, but isn't Most that part of, Adam, but isn't that part of the problem? Because if you are going to actually hang your hat on a specific alternative to money, you need to actually identify what that's going to be. The fact that you've got 2,000 of these things uh, and more proliferating is part of the problem, isn't it? No, fair question. If I, if I fork uh, the US dollar and I say I have US dollar cash and then US dollar SV and then US dollar Martin coin, just because it's got the name US dollar in it doesn't mean it is actually US dollar. So when Bitcoin forked, it didn't actually create a new Bitcoin. It didn't actually create a, an expansion of the supply of Bitcoin. When Bitcoin forks, and this is where you have... Um, if you will, big debate or big fight, big, big tension within the crypto community itself, just within mm. side, because you have these things called Bitcoin purists. Mm. Now, at the beginning of this, I, I said, I really want to emphasize just on Bitcoin, but your question is more than fair because there is a confusion that when Bitcoin forks, it's either increasing the supply or creating confusion about, actually, I, I will pay that because what happens is people get scammed, not scammed, but misled because it has the word Bitcoin in it. So I'll, I'll do a slight digression here where one of your viewers left a, a comment in our last video and they said, Adam, what do you mean no one owns Bitcoin? And I was going to write back to her, I think it was her, and I was going to write back in quite uh, long detail and I thought I should actually make a video of it. What I mean by that is that there is no Bitcoin company. There is no centralized Bitcoin agency. Mm. Now, What's good and bad about that, what is good is that there is no centralized body that can control Bitcoin. They can't stop your payments. They can't create a new supply. They can't do anything that traditional or skeuomorphic designs of banking system could do with money. The bad side of that, though, is there is nothing stopping me right now writing a white paper that says Adam's Bitcoin or Martin's Bitcoins or Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin SV or Bitcoin Gold, Bitcoin Diamond, Bitcoin, anything that has been created. And the downside of that is that they're exploiting the name of Bitcoin. But the reality is, is that there is no matter what you fork and no matter what you name it, even if it, I think there's even one called the real Bitcoin mm. and the new Bitcoin and Bitcoin, everything else. But there is only one Bitcoin and that only that, that one Bitcoin so, is 21 so, so here's the question, right? All of those yeah. 2,000 different coins that have been created, right? Yep. Do they all have precisely the same value at the same time? No. Right. So that immediately says that, no, you haven't got a single, you haven't got a single currency. You've got multiple currencies. You've got more than 2,000 different flavours of Bitcoin-related currencies, right, who will be moving at differential value um, this is not a say, sustainable basis for creating a universal replacement for cash. Well, the, the same is a directly applicable. Uh, 
the same is firstly directly applicable to fiat currency. So if we say we've got the US dollar, the Australian dollar, the New mm -hmm. Zealand dollar, the Canadian dollar, well, I would apply straight away that argument. So, well, hang on, we haven't got one universal supply. Yeah, but we've got 230 or whatever it is, right? One for each of the major countries in the world. Agree, yeah. Right? But... Uh, <laughs> with those, with those You've, already <laughs> You've already got yes, more than two thousand. You've already got more than two thousand. There'll be another five thousand. Exactly. Truth, so so no, isn't the, the, isn't that fragmentation? I mean, apart from the confusion in the minds of uh, the average punter, because there are more and more of these things with different values. Yeah. How the hell do you navigate your way through that? You know, do you back Bitcoin? Do you back whatever, whatever, whatever? Right? And and people actually then get on their high horse and say, no, it's Ripple or it's um, you know, it's this one or that one or whatever it is. Um, that's part of the problem. I think that was a major mistake. If, if I were executing a strategy for a digital replacement, I would actually be looking for a single unified alternative, which is, by the way, what Mark, Car Mark, Mark Carney said. Mark Carney said, you can't do it with all of these fragmented different alternatives. You need a standardised universal replacement linked back to some fundamental value, by the way, as well, but that's another story, right? Because, because this proliferation thing is going to go on and it's get, get, going to get more and more confusing. And by the way, what also happened is that people then get scammed through the process, right? Because they're not sure what they're buying into and then exchanges collapse. And then, you know, that's something which is a reality at the moment. So there is only one Bitcoin. There, remember, we need to make this distinction. Yes, there are over 2,000 cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are over 200 fiat currencies. There is only one US dollar. There is only one Bitcoin. Now, if you and I make a nation, for argument's sake, it's probably a poor example, but if you and I make <laughs> a nation and we call it the, the, the Martin Adam dollar, well, if we were a sovereign nation, and this goes back to the sovereignty on the internet and this new sovereign global market, if we can determine a value in that money for what, for every way, whether we link it through a finite supply or linking it to gold or just the market determining that they need it, then it has value. Hmm. Let, me, let me give another example. So how many different shares are there in the world? Well, there must be millions. Exactly, millions. Now, most of those shares are absolute nonsense. So I've been investing in shares since I was, I think, 18 and done terribly in many of them. And that doesn't mean that good shares, well, what's the number one share in the world? Is it Google or Apple? Um, I don't know, but let's say for argument's sake, it, it's Google. Let's say Google is the number one share in the world. Now, just because millions of other shares have no value because they're absolute rubbish, just as thousands of other cryptocurrencies have no real value because they're rubbish, doesn't mean that Google shares don't have a value. Now, ultimately, value is determined by the market. If the market says it has value, if I say this pen has value and no one else does, then it doesn't really have much value except for me. But if this is the only pen in the world, or there's only 21 million pens in the world, and there needs to be a need for this pen, then the market creates the value. Now, yes, people are being scammed in cryptocurrencies, most certainly. People have been scammed in shares for years. And an argument within the crypto community is that the biggest scam in the world, the biggest Ponzi scheme in the world is in fact fiat currency. And the Federal Reserve within the states being able to print as much money as they like. Bitcoin can't do that. So I, we really need to make the distinction that all those other thousands of cryptocurrencies are not Bitcoin and the free market has actually agreed with that. The free market has said that um, red coin is, I'll give you an example, red coin is it got a huge supply and the unit is worth about one one hundredth of a cent at the moment. Bitcoin only has 21 million, 18 million of which have been mined, about 17 and a half million of which have been mined. Approximately 6 million have been lost, so there's a, a remaining supply of about 13 million. And the market, the free market, the new sovereign nations, probably uh, clutching at straws here, but the new sovereignty of the economic market, of the internet market, has said, we value these Bitcoins this much. Now, so forks, forks are not Bitcoin. Forks are different coins. And just as we have millions of different types of shares, we have thousands of different types of cryptos. Bitcoin has a value currently of about $10,000, whereas uh, a uh, uh, Google share has a, a value of, of thousands of dollars. Other shares don't have much value at all, just as other cryptocurrencies don't have much value at all. Now, when it comes to a unit of count, 
I, I would argue that Bitcoin is a unit of account, but when it comes to linking it back to a value of something, we link that value back today with today's paradigm. We link that value back to the US dollar. Mm. And up until 1970, I think 73 or 74, during the Vietnam War, as you alluded to, when Nixon de-linked the gold standard from the dollar, we used to link dollars to gold. So we've never actually, for the last, well, certainly in my lifetime, my entire life that I've been alive, the fiat has never been linked to gold. Mm. But even if we go back to gold and we say, what is gold? I'm getting a bit philosophic, philosophical here, Martin. You should like this. <laughs> Naomi Brockman, a crypto goer, a commentator in Australia, she actually put this to Peter Schiff, and I thought it was a brilliant question. She said, "Gold's what's gold linked to?" And 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 that's the fundamental question of money. If we if we accept that, let's say that Bitcoin is linked to fiat, and fiat is linked to gold, well, what's gold linked to? Ultimately, what gold is linked to is an understanding that you and I say that gold has a value, hmm. just as in the past before gold, there was beads and feathers and knots. Yeah, well, it's about confidence, right? So basically, it's in the, you know, going, going back to really basic fundamentals, money only works if you and I both agree that it's a unit of account, medium exchange, store of value, right? Because otherwise we won't use it. And so, so if you don't all agree to play by those rules, whatever the particular commodity is that's actually being connoted uh, as effectively um, you know, money, uh, it won't work. So there's a, there's a big confidence thing here in it you need and it's actually what i call the network effect right it only works if you have enough people who essentially all believe that this is actually worth something now of course what tends to happen is if you read the small writing on the notes it's basically it's the government that stands behind the value of the note so you know that if you take your ten dollar note to any bank in australia you'll be able to get ten dollars for it or if you go to a shop you can actually buy $10 worth of goods at a particular point in time, right? That's effectively an agreed set of rules. It goes back to my worldview. That's the worldview that we're operating in at the moment. Now, if we move to an alternative worldview where effectively Bitcoin is the replacement, right, there you have to have enough um, uh, network effect for it to be um, effective in a particular location. And it has to effectively start doing the same sorts of things as other forms of money do now. Um, I said to you, I think ubiquitous is an issue at the moment for Bitcoin. There are a few things that you can do with it. And I even know there are a few ATMs where you can actually um, push um, money in and get a Bitcoin out if that's what you really want to do or vice versa. Um, but there's not really a deep, um, a deep market, right? So now the question is, is that going to evolve? Maybe it will. But then I come back to what I keep saying, and that is there's a tussle going on between the decentralized Bitcoin alternatives and the more centralized controlled uh, monetary systems whatever they may be ever being advocated by central banks and by um, governments and the IMF and all of those so essentially you've got this massive um, tussle going on between the existing um, players and the existing economies and the existing regulators all of whom are saying there's no chance that Bitcoin is going to get up as a as, as a long term um, medium of exchange store of value. Um, there is a chance that some other alternative digital might, but there's a hell of a lot of work to be doing in the meantime. And we've got to cover things like ownership and identity and money laundering, etc. Et you know, you, they, you, the list gets longer and longer and longer. Right. Um, so <laughs> the, the gulf between where we are now and where you would envision you would like to get to, I think is much huger than I think many crypto um, bulls would actually really want to recognize. The biggest uh, critics publicly of uh, Bitcoin in the public space are those who have the most to lose. And that, as I mentioned, was, was the fa those who have failed to innovate, and that is the banks. So <laughs> ultimately, if you had a business model, I, I give two business models. One, let's say you're a Federal Reserve where you can just print as much money as you want. Uh, and even if there was a, a video clip out there, I'll try and link it below, where the chairman of the Federal Reserve says, we don't have to worry about debt in the USA because no matter what debt we've got, we can just print more money. Now, mm. his, those are his words, maybe yep. not paraphrased directly, but th those are his words. So on one hand, you've got this model that says, I can print as much money as I want, and no matter how much debt we get into, I can just print more to pay it off. 
So anything that comes in to threaten that, I would be saying any and everything in my power, not not um, undermining what you've just said, but uh, in, in pure business terms, if something was going to be that threatening to me, I would do everything in my power to undermine it. Now we go into the next space of digital money. Every transaction going through MasterCard, Visa, PayPal, Apple Pay, banks, uh, at Western Union as example. So the remittance market is worth about half a trillion dollars per year. And the remittance market uh, is mainly for third world people where essentially uh, people are going overseas, earning money and sending it back to primarily uh, their, their women, uh, statistically. And those women are using that money for uh, sanitization within their community, education and health. And Western Union, who currently has about 90% of the world remittance market, is, is making billions of dollars every year in taking up to, and sometimes more, than 10% of those transactions. So as an example, I, if I go over, let's say I'm a, a third world uh, employee, I go over to the Middle East, which I've, I've seen a fair bit over there. Uh, I go to the Middle East, I work hard, I earn all this money, I send it back to my family. It takes three to seven days. They take a 10% cut. But ironically, and that's how I have to send money to my family. I have to go, th I have to even drive into town if I'm unbanked per se. I have to go to a Western Union counter during business hours, wait for that money to go over there and do this transaction. Yet, if I've got a phone, I can text you a picture, a letter, a video file, but not money. But Bitcoin says, well, no, you can actually text money. You can do it for a fraction of a cent. You can do it within. 10 minutes and as the network gets faster within seconds so as we move over and, and you might say and I, I if you will I can predict what you're about to say it's like yeah but then they've got to exchange that Bitcoin for their traditional currency over there well I would say says who if the person in that country whoever it doesn't matter where they are if that if that if I send money to my wife in India, I don't have a wife in India, but going for this <laughs> example, I send this money to my wife in India and then she goes down to the bakery and the bakery says we accept bitcoin a deflationary income as opposed to an inflationary income then you have this medium of exchange now i would also argue that you only need two people to have a medium of exchange you don't need everyone to do it need proof not everyone accepts the us dollar not everyone accepts the australian dollar and not everyone accepts gold i can't go to woolworths and buy a loaf of bread with the gram of gold in my so if, even if I offer to give them all of my gold, they won't accept it. So there is actually no one global currency, but that doesn't mean it doesn't work. Now, when we go to the medium of exchange, I would argue that it is a medium of exchange because I buy stuff with Bitcoin. So, for example, the, um, the intro video to, to my channel, uh, it was actually paid for with Ethereum. But I've done work with the same provider who sometimes wanted Bitcoin or Litecoin. Now, he had a choice of the US dollar and one time he did take it via PayPal which he, he lost a fair bit on because there was a, a cut in the exchange but at other times admittedly I've sent him Bitcoin or Ethereum and Bitcoin and Ethereum has gone down but over other times I've sent it to him and it's gone up exponentially but in any case he had a choice and that's why I would ask why do we have to use a sovereign nation's money Yes, we can give them tax. Yes, they can watch what we're doing, noting that everything on the blockchain can be seen, more so than cash, noting that the biggest use of illegal money for illegal transactions in the world is in fact the US dollar. We don't ban the US dollar because people use it for drugs. Uh, we actually put drug enforcement agencies around it. Now, Bitcoin is more transparent than cash. Um, there, there are privacy coins. They would be a threat to a government, noting there's over 2,000 cryptocurrencies and they're calling like Monero coin, which is a privacy coin that governments can't see, no one can see. Those are the ones that would probably be targeted by government. Long rant here, I realise. If two people agree that this is value and the tax man can get his cut from it and I can leave banks out of the equation and I can text you that money from anywhere on planet Earth within seconds, as opposed to going through Western Union and waiting seven days and paying them 10%. Why is, why is this so bad? <laughs> well, if you look at it from a utility point of view as an individual level, you're right. There is no 
negativity that I can see because effectively if you both agree that that's the way you want to exchange value you should be able to do it but you can't walk away from the political economic and social reality that the existing incumbents are actually very very keen to play within the existing rules rather than the new rules and they will do everything they possibly can to essentially force this new world into the old world and you know Libra is an example I think of that you know moving closer to if you like something which is more acceptable to the existing centers of power and, and I guess what I'm trying to highlight is this is more a political issue and you know frankly a broader economic issue than it is purely a financial decision in terms of which currency do I use to pay right and the reason it's going that direction is because of the concerns there was somebody quite recently from the Federal Reserve who was giving a speech in Germany and said she believed that a significant proportion of Bitcoin transactions were money laundering illegal etc etc to which I thought well how do you know how can you possibly know that right I mean it's it's sort of convenient to run that argument but very little behind but there are these very influential people within the existing system and structure who basically are very much pushing the barrow of it'll never happen for these reasons right it becomes a political debate a political argument um, I'm waiting for the first government who's going to actually come out and say right we're going to scrap our own currency and we're going to actually go cryptocurrency I wonder how many votes they get at the election I see our world's coming together again Martin this is why I love talking <laughs> to you because I agree it's more political than I'd argue the technology so uh, horse and cart was the the mode of transport for years no. then the internal combustion engine or we had the steam engine then the internal combustion engine and as when the first car came out it by law by law there was three people that had to drive the car you had the, the steerer the engineer and then a person walking in front of the car waving a red flag saying this impending doom is is driving down the street hmm. and many people say well why do we need a car when we've got a horse and cart now of course now a horse and cart still exists but it's just for fun or weddings or romantic times or in in, in some ways third world countries and the same happened for every technology I remember I th when the telephone came out a British gentleman said why do we need a telephone when we have message boys we can just put a message here and send a message boy then when email came out to send an email you had to write lines and lines of unix code and it was a very cumbersome process now i can send an email with a swipe in fact i can send an email without even touching my phone i can just tell my phone to send an email and in fact even go back a step email wasn't even on phone it had to be on a computer mm. so I, I agree that there's a lot of pressure on bitcoin but I would argue that the reason why the pressure is on Bitcoin is because those who stand to lose the most, banks, hmm. Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, they will lose everything if Bitcoin is accepted. So when you transact in Bitcoin, you don't have a bank account. You are a bank. Yep. You're, you are your own bank. So this whole need, the whole, again, skeuomorphic design of a bank is now completely obsolete and gone. And in the crypto community, we say that Bitcoin is in fact a gift, except for XRP, which I'll get to in a second. But your rebuttal on that, my friend. Well, there's two, two points. The first is, um, if you think there are probably, well, there are 30 globally significant banks as designated by the banking system around the world, right? So there are about 10 in the US, there are about six or seven in Europe, there are four in I think it's four in China and a few others around the world, right? And they hold 75% of all of the uh, major transaction flows around the world, right? So understand how concentrated the existing banking system currently is. And they are in it to protect themselves and their shareholders. So that's the first issue, right, in terms of, the, I talked about the political environment. It is the political and the commercial environment. Second point is pretty much all of the major central banks around the world who are studying, in inverted commas, the crypto world are all arguing against a, a Bitcoin and for some sort of asset-backed or central bank-controlled 
alternative. And that's a very powerful set of arguments. And of course, they've got political support as well. So, so that's the political and commercial reality against which you're, you're working. Now, I agree that those are the battles that have to be won. I don't think it's a technology battle at all. I agree with you. I think the ubiquity of Bitcoin and the fact that you know you can make the transaction simply and straightforwardly on the smartphone or the technology is is absolutely right. It's not that's not the that's not the center of gravity of the problem, right? It is this political will thing. It is fundamentally about old world, new world. And you're right. Eventually, the old world passes. But I think in this case, it ain't going to pass any anytime soon, right? And I remember IBM, was it in the 50s? They said, well, we'll probably need about five computers around the world, right? That should be enough. Uh, you know, the world's changed. And the world will change, absolutely right. Um, I'm sure that the payment platforms will change. But I think that we shouldn't underestimate the power of those 30 G civs plus or minus and the power of the central banks and the political apparatus around it. And by the way, um, if you think of China, China, of course, already has um, digital currencies working within their environment, right, as part of their overall digital um, strategies. So, in fact, in many ways, China's ahead of the curve on some of this stuff, but they're not using Bitcoin. I... I agree with you. We should not underestimate the power of these banks. They have more money than, dare we say, God. I don't mean that by any disrespect to our religious viewers. But they literally do have more money than anyone else because they can print it and they can create it out of thin air. Well, so no, again, cent cent central banks can. Commercial banks and the GSIBs can't, right? But they still have huge, they have huge power and influence. And by the way, the, the tussle that's going on at the moment, look at the repo and the reverse repo markets, the tussle between some of those GSIBs and the central bank in the, in the US is remarkable, right? Because effectively, uh, the central bank is being forced to do things simply because of what both, the, some of those big players are wanting. That's the true dynamic against which we have to consider the future of digital money and, and Bitcoin and those sorts of things. Now, there are certainly different levels of being able to produce money, but I, I think through fractional reserve lending, when we, we discussed this, I think, in our second video, mm. but at, at different um, levels, you have non-elected centralised bodies that can essentially produce money. Yeah, produce yeah. So the central banks money. can print money. I'm just saying that the private banks can't. Uh, agreed. But then, uh, as you mentioned, they're operating in a, shall we say, probably a monopolistic or... Yeah, 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 business. yeah. No, exactly. And, and they can create credit... Right, yep. as we've discussed before, they can create a credit entry that creates uh, creates money, but it, it, it's that's not printing. Printing money is what the the QE from the the major guys are doing. So just to be clear about the distinction between the two, both entities, both sets of entities, are indeed inflating the amount of money in circulation, but they're doing it differently. Agreed. So they're both producing money. Yep. One way or both, another. Both diluting the but, value of assets. Yep. And, right. and inflating our currency by basically, as you said, diluting it. Yep, debasing it. And that is immense power, but yep. I don't underestimate the power of the people. That sounds pretty... <laughs> 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 okay, well, like, you know, but, the, uh, but, the, but, the, but you, know, you make an important point, right? Because if, if you listen to the Libra guys, right, they say, whatever you may think, this is, you know, to, to, to the existing communities, there are two billion plus of people who are basically unbanked, unable to be banked, they should be allowed from a democratic perspective to be able to do things that everybody else can do around the world and Libra is a path that enables them. So, I mean, that's the way that they're going, right? And I think they're actually onto something because essentially you've got to go round the existing system and the existing banks and the existing central banks. You can't just effectively play the same game as them. And that's the challenge, I think, as to how this is going to play out, because we, we have to find an alternative route and, and whether that's actually, you know, bottom up, um, which will take a long time, or whether it's something like Libra, be interesting to see, or whether it's an alternative as per the central banks. A lot of uh, different issues in play. 
the true power of Bitcoin, as I was touching on before, is that unlike Libra, the Libra Foundation, which uh, was led by Facebook and had a conglomerate of many companies, big <laughs> companies, including yep. MasterCard and Visa themselves, and PayPal, which have since dropped out for whatever yep. reason, perhaps because of that political power that we're referring to. I certainly yep. think so. In my opinion, that's why I th think so. But there is no Bitcoin company to take to the to court. There is no Bitcoin CEO. There's no Bitcoin chair or board or body. It's like saying I'm taking the internet to court. You can't take the internet. There's no one to. You can take internet providers to court. You can take servers to court. You can take website providers to court. But you can't actually take the internet per se for, to court. Yep. And that's why Bitcoin is the internet of money because it's, it's unstoppable. You can say <laughs> you're not going to use it. But I'll, I'll give a couple of examples here. So when I was in China... I lived in Asia for a while. I didn't live mm. in China, but I used to visit there a fair bit. Now, Facebook is banned. Yep. So what do you think all the young people did in China with Facebook? They just got VPNs. And I saw it all the time. You'd be in a bar and they just open a VPN and be surfing the world on, on, um, on Facebook using mm. a VPN. Mm. So that's not legal, but it just shows that the, the market doesn't care. If there's something that's really important and something, well, is Facebook important? The market determined it as important and many people were using it. So these young people were doing that and they were using it anyway. Now, when it comes to does China uh, use Bitcoin? Well, they're spending millions on mining Bitcoin and making mining machines. Yes, on one hand, it's a business. And some would argue that they're setting up their mining farms next to uh, essentially over um, excess energy. So they might have, as an example, a big uh, geothermal area or a dam that's producing a, a fair bit of excess energy and they'll divert that free energy per se to a bitcoin mining farm and there's kind of nothing really to lose in the sense that they're just mining this bitcoin out of the code mm. so they're stockpiling it there yep. but then when you get on to the decentralization of everything so first of all we agree that money is already digitized then i would go on to say that bitcoin is merely an application on a decentralized ledger. So the, the blockchain, if you will, is the technology and Bitcoin is merely the first application yep. on that technology. I agree. Just like the internet, the first application on the internet was kind of email. The email, internet can do many things, but m mainly most people knew the first application on the internet was email. Now, Bitcoin is merely an application on, on the blockchain. Now, then we get into these so I, I think all money, all money will be on the blockchain because it is far more efficient. I, I, I totally agree with you. The distinction you've just made between blockchain and Bitcoin is absolutely essential, right? Because you started this conversation by saying the future is Bitcoin. Now you're saying correctly, in my view, now the future is a blockchain based alternative and absolutely agree with you for all the reasons of efficiency security all those things blockchain will ultimately underpin whatever the next generation uh, currency digital currency whatever it is will be but the question is will it be bitcoin or will it be something else i guess uh, i get what you're saying i i still don't back down from the statement that the future will be bitcoin and, and the reason why i don't back so yes bitcoin is still the application on on the blockchain mm. but the key difference is it is a decentralized model yep. so there's no for some reason we think that we have to keep money in a bank or we have to keep money in a centralized body bitcoin tells us no we don't have to do that there's no reason why we have to keep money in a centralized body there's no reason whatsoever it is completely prehistoric and serves no purpose in a modern time now, with this blockchain technology, the reason why Bitcoin is more than just a unit of currency, it's almost like, in many ways, dare I say, a movement. A movement because it says, hey, we don't need you banks, we don't need you centralized bodies, we don't need you federal reserves, we don't need uh, some lawmaking, lawmaker telling us if we can and can't use it. We, the market, we, the people, we decide what its value is, who's going to accept it and who's not going to accept it. I give an example of, are these money? frequent flyer points, vouchers, uh, movie tickets, bus tickets, loyalty points. Now, are they money? Well, I can buy a plane ticket with frequent flyer points. So it's a store of value, it's a unit of account, and it's a medium of exchange. But is it money? Well, it goes back to what is money. In my opinion, money is a language. Uh, in, at an extreme example, if I go through I was in Cambodia a while ago. I don't speak any Cambodian whatsoever. I was trying to negotiate for something at a shop 
We didn't speak the same language, but when I pulled out the US dollar, we were speaking the same language. <laughs> we understood that a transaction was about to occur. We understood the medium of exchange and the unit of account. Now, when it comes to things like frequent flyer points, bus tickets, loyalty cards, gift vouchers, well, some people will accept them and some people won't, but they're still a medium of exchange. But pushing this back to blockchain technology and decentralized um, apps and decentralized technologies, I want to make the distinction with you uh, with two types of cryptocurrencies. Essentially, you have a cryptocurrency which is merely a store of value. Bitcoin is the core example. And there are thousands of imitations of Bitcoin, Bitcoin gold, even Litecoin, Redcoin, all these different coins that all they do is they exchange a value. That value is locked on a decentralized ledger, a, a ledger that says, I'm now passing this unit of account to you. You now have that unit of account. Then you've got a different type of cryptocurrency, a smart cryptocurrency, a smart algorithm that is moving on to the decentralization of everything. So I've made a video on the decentralization of everything. And I'll give an example. Imagine a world where instead of you and me having to buy an entire house, we could buy a brick of a house. And when I say a brick, I mean that metaphorically. So instead of taking the title of one house, and I'll shout out to one of your viewers who's been smashing me in the comments. I think it's Red said. This is to you, my brother, who's saying he can't, He's quite upset at me for getting too many houses, which I can understand where he's coming from. But through decentralized apps, our old mate Red wouldn't in fact have to buy an entire house. And through smart contracts, we could take a house as an example. Any asset could be a house, a boat, a car, a taxi, an aeroplane, this microphone, it doesn't matter. And we could take that asset and we could break it up into 100 million parts. And through the power of the blockchain and decentralized applications, you could buy one brick per se of that house. And what that does is going back to our good, our good friends in the third world. Instead of them being cut out of a property market where one person can't buy a title to an entire house, you could in fact have an entire village, a community, a city, or even just one person within that city buy one brick of one house. So this is where the Bitcoin decentralized and smart app movement moves into the full inclusion of global commerce, not just with the exchange of a unit of value in money, but also a unit of value in real estate, uh, other property, other assets, where things can be broken up into into micro transactions. Uh, I'll get, sorry, I'll get into micro transactions, but let's say micro contracts. Instead of buying a whole house, you buy a portion of a house. Then we go on to the power of decentralized applications, and I'll give the bushfire as an example. So we've got the bushfires at the moment, and as we know, there's a bit of political pressure saying, hey, why aren't you giving, why aren't you giving the people more money? Through a decentralized application, if enough people voted, and this is just a concept, but it would work through the blockchain and decentralized applications. If enough people said, hey, we need to move more money to Victoria, then instead of organizations saying, we're gonna donate this money to Victoria, money could go into a decentralized pool. And when the people speak, that money could be relocated to wherever it's needed. So I'm giving a couple examples here of decentralized contracts that could be broken up almost infinitely to own something or on the other side if we don't want to own it we can actually break up the direction of money taking centralized pools of money that is held in if you will an escrow account held by no one and when the people speak it is channeled to where it's needed and that's kind of the bitcoin vibe in the sense that there is not one centralized body trying to push all this money around where they want to, when they want to, to an amount of how much they want to. Sure. Well, I think um, we agree on a few things, right? The first is the potential in terms of the disaggregation of, of commerce and the ability to be able to use digital under a blockchain umbrella is definitely there. I agree with, well, I think we both agree on that. Um, second, I think we both agree that there is a whole bunch of political tussle going on between old world, new world, and that you can't see this as purely a technology conversation. It has a political and economic overlay because there are big uh, things at stake on both sides of the, of the fence, right? 
And thirdly, I think we probably also agree that many in the crypto community are actually not helped by the creation of multi, uh, you know, multi, multifarious numbers of different versions and some of the confusion around that and the lack of clarity okay. from the crypto community is actually not helping. And by the way, I'd also argue that the volatility of, crypt, of the crypto um, currencies themselves are also not helping. So in a way, you know, we're at this very early stage. But I'm with you in terms of saying there is a huge potential opportunity and you know, it can actually produce huge value potentially. It can release a whole bunch of capabilities to um, the unbanked and for uh, you know, other people around the world. But I come back to the political conundrum that we're in and the lack of appetite from the existing incumbents to really step out because I think they'll continue to protect the status quo for as long as they can. If there's anything I get out of our conversations, Martin, it's how we have a, a deep dive into any topic that we look at and we actually come around and actually find we have a lot more in common than we realize. <laughs> I, I, Funny I've that. Discovered a lot, yeah, I've discovered a lot with you tonight and I hope our viewers can actually uh, discover this with us that even if we're opposing ends of the spectrum, it's I sometimes look at it as religion. Sometimes we're all praying for the same God, but in a different way. And even if that God is just your own values and and um, personal beliefs, and at the end of the day, I think we all we all want to look after our family. We all want to do what's fair. We all want to do what's right. And um, there's many ways to approach that. But when it when it comes to uh, just as we close this off, noting that we've been going for a while, when it comes to the education of things like crypto, I do push out to your viewers that if if you're not sure how crypto works come over to my channel or any of the channels out there in the crypto community <laughs> and explore explore what this new fangdangle technology is. In, to, to give you some background, Martin, I had no interest of making a, a YouTube channel. I had no interest of being in front of the camera. Uh, and I had no interest of discussing money publicly. But when I discovered Bitcoin and, in, and truly how powerful this thing is and this gift that has been given to us, noting that it was a don donated, that is the code, the, the white paper was given to the people anonymously. We don't know who invented it. The, I mean, it goes under the pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto, but we don't know if it's a he, a she, a them, a they. We don't know anything about it. It was just given to the people and it was given to the people after the global financial crisis. And some argue it's the greatest gift that we've ever been given. And it's so confronting this gift that you get so much pushback, as we've said, uh, politically, and particularly from those who have uh, so much to lose. You get so much enthusiasm from people, I guess, like me in the crypto community who are like, wow, look at this thing. And I will just touch on quickly before we close off on XRP, because I've noticed uh, that there was one of my subscribers who, who rightfully put me in my place, uh, Agora, I'm shouting out to you, because he said, I said, I, on behalf of the crypto community, X, Y, Z. And he rightfully said, no, the XRP community doesn't believe this. And the big difference with XRP and Bitcoin is that Bitcoin aims to be a bank, whereas XRP aims to facilitate bank transactions. And the reason why XRP, in my opinion, is third on the uh, global markets at the moment, is you have Bitcoin at number one, Ethereum at number two, and XRP at number three, is because the big gamble in the world at the moment is will banks exist in 10 years and if they do exist many believe they'll use xrp to facilitate these transactions through their liquidity pools the power of the blockchain and these very quick transactions but i put it out there i, I certainly own xrp i've I hedged my bets but if banks do in, exist in 10 years there is an argument i put forward that why would the banks use xrp when they could use their own cryptocurrency Equally, as you've put out the argument, if Bitcoin does exist in the future, why would, uh, why would economies use Bitcoin when they could create their own cryptocurrency? I don't have the answer to this. I don't know what will happen in the future. I believe it will be Bitcoin. I believe in the free market. I believe the power to the people. I believe banks are a thing of the past. But if banks survive and they choose to use XRP, that's for that takeoff. But if they do survive and choose not to use XRP, that's where it may not go forward. But that was just a little side note I put in there on XRP. <laughs> As I've been ranting most of this video, Martin, can I please give you the final word? Yeah, I want to come back to frame of reference, right? Remember our last video where we said 
people need to understand that there is a context within which they are thinking about a particular subject, right? And I would argue that one of the most valuable things that people can do is to understand the frame of reference that they're thinking about this debate within. Because at the moment, my view is that we have actually a frame of reference within the crypto community, and we have a frame of reference within the existing communities today, particularly those that are actually central bank orientated or the, the 30 GSIBs, right? The point I want to make is that those two frames of reference are incompatible. And that, for me, is why there's going to be a tussle ahead why we're going to end up with a number of years where we're going to see effectively a battle playing out between new world, old world, old world, new world. Because the frame of references cannot be married. They are actually too different. And that's why I think this is not going to get solved anytime soon. May I please add two more frames of reference to those <laughs> two that you pointed out? Yep. We have the next generation of children that will never hear the words three to five business days for a transaction and if That's they true. do hear it they will laugh their head off as they walk out looking at a fax machine in a museum and the other frame of reference is the third world countries who will in my opinion leapfrog banks completely and just simply start texting money to each other but i certainly accept that's my frame of reference perhaps there's a fifth and sixth frame of reference I encourage <laughs> everybody viewers, carries everybody oh, carries their own yeah, Martin, this has been great. I, I love talking to you. I, I really do wish you West, uh, the best in the, um, the t tomorrow in the bushfires. Hopefully they pass safely, per se. If there Thank is you. such a way of saying it. Uh, I hope the winds are kind to us. I hope we get rain. I've been waiting. We haven't had rain for months down here. No, All my tanks not. are dry. Yep. Um, not me. Have you got enough water in your tank? Yes, I have. Yeah, we had a big one big downpour about mm, six weeks, eight weeks ago. And we've been uh, rationing the, the use of the water. So we've got nearly a full tank. Well, I wish you and your community all the best. Martin North, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Great talking to you once again. Take care.